may come as a surprise to some of you, but mitochondria-rich tumors can actually occur throughout the entire body, from the salivary gland to the parotid to the thyroid, where they are called Herthel cell carcinoma, to the breast, the pancreas, the adrenal glands, and even the kidney, where they are referred to as renal oncocytoma. Now, these mitochondria-rich tumors would likely have come as quite a surprise to this guy, Otto Warburg, who nearly 100 years ago observed that tumor cells have a proclivity to undergo aerobic, rest, excuse me, undergo aerobic glycolysis despite adequate oxygenation, which he later went on to posit was due to a lack of effective mitochondria. Thus, I think Otto would have been quite taken aback if I were to have shown him this, which is an electron micrograph of renal oncocytoma. And as you can clearly see, these tumor cells are completely filled with a striking number of mitochondria. This mitochondrial accumulation is of unclear etiology at this time, nor is it known how this may contribute to tumorigenesis or if they, acting as a veritable Trojan horse, somehow help make manifest the tantalizing inability of these tumors to really ever metastasize, a property that allows for complete cure with surgical excision despite impressive tumor growth. Now, one simply has to look at the gross macromolecular differences in hues amongst kidney cancers to appreciate that there is a rich metabolic spectrum on display from the distinct yellow color of clear cell kidney cancer owing to its accumulation of fat to the mahogany brown, almost muscle-like color of renal oncocytoma correlating with its preponderance of mitochondria. These tumors tend to favor glycolysis, while these tumors show a marked upregulation of oxfos. Whether this metabolic rewiring somehow contributes to the tendency of these tumors to behave aggressively while these remain indolent is a speculation of great intrigue. Now, much of our understanding of the biology of kidney tumors has come from years of detailed histopathologic examination of the stereotype macromolecular cellular changes that occur across kidney cancer. Clear cell kidney cancer is so named because of a cytoplasmic clearing due to the accumulation of fat and glycogen in these cells. On the other hand, renal oncocytoma along with a variant of chromophobe kidney cancer known as the eosinophilic form, has as its sine qua non pathology a hallmark granular eosinophilic cytoplasm due to its mitochondrial accumulation. Now, much of our understanding of the molecular basis of these cellular changes has been greatly benefited by the large-scale application of modern cancer genomic studies to these kidney tumors, informing us that clear cell is a disorder of hypoxia-inducible factor signaling. Papillary kidney cancer shows activation of MET. Interestingly, a subset of papillary kidney cancer is deterministically linked to mutations in fumarate hydratase, a mitochondrial TCA cycle enzyme. Chromophobe kidney cancer shows loss of P53 and P10. And interestingly, renal oncocytoma, along with the eosinophilic variant of chromophobe that has the mitochondrial accumulation, both harbor mutations in mitochondrial DNA, specifically in complex one. This is very surprising because a recent pan-cancer analysis actually showed that mitochondrial DNA mutations were categor categorically selected against in cancer. Thus, the presence of these mtDNA mutations in these tumors argues that there's some context specificity potentially related to their form of cancer metabolism. Now, complex one represents the very first step in mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation, a cascade of reactions that take place in the inner mitochondrial membrane that culminate in the production of ATP. The work that David just shared with us, dihydroorotate dehydrogenase, is right here in the second step of the mitochondrial electron transport chain. Importantly, all of oxfos is encoded for by two separate genomes, the nuclear and the mitochondrial DNA. A defect in oxfos or a patient with a mitochondrial apathy can present due to a molecular alteration in either genome. 
the classic finding on histopathologic examination of a muscle biopsy coming from a patient with mitochondrial disease is that of the ragged red fiber, so named because there is a subsarcolemal accumulation on Gomori trichrome stain in regions of intense mitochondrial accumulation akin to what we observe in our tumors. This is also analogous to what can be seen in brown fat, the physiologic state whereby mitochondria accumulate due to hormonal signaling, which is also incidentally a classic mimic of malignancy on a PET scan. Thus, the question became for us whether the pathologic or the physiologic signaling cascades taking place in these two biologic states was somehow germane to the mitochondrial accumulation seen in our tumor type, and also if they somehow related to the oncogenic cascade. To address this question, we developed the following study design where we collected 19 patients seen here at the Mass General Hospital and performed whole exome sequencing. In addition, we also reanalyzed recent large-scale cancer genomic data sets that had also performed whole exome sequencing. Utilizing off-target reads for the mitochondrial DNA, one man's genomic trash is another's genomic gold. We were able to reconstruct with high coverage the entire mitochondrial genome in order to subject it to our mtDNA platform. Our mtDNA platform is a next generation sequencing based platform that aims to interrogate mitochondrial DNA at the level of its sequence, its copy number, or the number of mtDNA molecules per cell, which depending on the organ of interest ranges from 100 to 1000. And finally, it's heteroplasmy, which is the percentage of mtDNA molecules with a variant allele or a mutation. In this case, two out of five mtDNAs have this mutation, so this would correspond to a heteroplasmy level of 40%. The mitochondrial DNA is a small 16.5 kb extranuclear chromosome that encodes two ribosomal RNAs, 22 transfer RNAs, and 13 polypeptides, all of which participate in oxidative phosphorylation. There are seven genes dedicated to complex one, Complex two, interestingly, comes entirely from the nucleus. Interestingly, mutations in complex two cause cancer. This is succinate dehydrogenase. Dihydroorotate dehydrogenase is the reaction that takes place right here from uh, complex two's reaction. There's one gene for complex three, three genes for complex four, and finally, two genes for complex five. Now, in order to illustrate the somatic landscape of mtDNA variants in our cohort, I have linearized the mtDNA molecule, and I show it here from start to finish. This grid represents our entire cohort, where each horizontal line is one patient. Each diamond represents a mutational event. What I'd first like to draw your attention to is the color schema, where red indicates loss of function mutations, either nonsense or frame-shifting events. As you can see, there is a plethora of loss of function mutations in our cohort. I'd next like to draw your attention to the high heteroplasmy level, which is encoded by the size of the diamond, with the large diamonds representing a greater than 80% allylic fraction, or heteroplasmy. This is important for two reasons. Number one, this intimates that there could be positive selection for these variants. The tumor cells like this. Second, due to the multi-copy nature of the mitochondrial genome, mutations are effectively buffered out. They do not become manifest in terms of a defect in OxFos until a certain threshold heteroplasmy is reached, and that threshold is typically about 70%. Thereby, all of these mutations, I would predict, would be of OxFos detriment in this tumor type. All of these loss of function mutations, as you can see, occur in complex one encoding subunits. There is no mutations outside of complex one genes. Furthermore, another bona fide criteria of a cancer driver uh, gene, these mutations are recurrent. The exact same mutation in our cohort occurred in eight different patients. There were other regions on the mtDNA allele where the exact same mutation also occurred. Further, furthermore, with each line representing a patient, these were mutually exclusive of each other all criteria suggesting that these could be real non-nuclear driver events that are occurring in these tumors coming from the mtDNA. Now, recent large-scale cancer genomic data sets were published that included kidney tumors that were agnostic to the mtDNA status. We downloaded and reanalyzed that data 
for the mtDNA, and in this cohort of renal oncocytoma patients, the exact same genetic signature, which was missed because they didn't look at the mtDNA, was recapitulated in this second orthogonal cohort. Now, very interestingly, there is a mutational signature at play. All of these loss of function mutations are small indels that are occurring in homopolymeric DNA tracts. These homopolymeric DNA tracts are evenly distributed throughout the entire mitochondrial genome. They are not unique to complex one genes, as represented by a vertical tick mark signifying the presence of a homopolymeric tract. Thus, this suggests that stochastically, when a frame shifting indel occurs in this homopolymeric indel and when it's in a complex one gene, then selection can occur, and that this may be relevant for tumorigenesis. I showed this same data via a more traditional cancer commute plot, where each vertical line represents a patient. And again, as you can see, where red indicates loss of function and complex one genes are showing here, 16 out of 19 of our patients had the exact same high heteroplasmy loss of function mutation in complex one genes. We also looked at the nucleus, and based on what we were statistically powered to detect, there were no recurrent nuclear mutations. Again, bolstering the verisimilitude that the mtDNA mutation could be the genetic driver in these tumor types. When we looked at copy number alterations, these are just some isolated events that were seen in the exome, but when we looked at copy number alterations, there was recurrent loss of chromosome 1. The majority of our tumors had a complete loss of one copy of chromosome 1. Furthermore, based on old literature, a subset of these tumors have been shown to have cyclin D1 rearrangements. Now, due to technical reasons, we weren't able to assay for cyclin D1 rearrangement. However, a bona fide way of interrogating tumors for cyclin D1 rearrangement is via immunohistochemistry. This is what's done in mantle cell lymphoma. And we performed this on our cohort. We identified, again, that a distinct subset of these tumors were also cyclin D1 positive. I, virtually our entire cohort could be explained by an mtDNA mutation plus chromosome 1 loss, and finally, cyclin D1 overexpression. This led us to propose the following genetic model whereby an mtDNA mutation sets the stage or acts as the first hit, taking out complex 1. In this context, OxFos is perturbed in such a way that the robust mitochondrial accumulation may ensue. Simultaneously, this may create a context for the cell that allows for positive selection to occur when chromosome 1 is lost and cyclin D1 becomes rearranged. These two events may contribute then to the tumorigenic cascade that occurs subsequently. Importantly, comparing to other cancer literature, cyclin D1 rearrangement by itself or chromosome 1 loss may not be sufficient to produce a tumor. So therefore, we think there's something going on here that creates signal that adds to these two events and in tribute to Knudsen acts as a for one two hit hypothesis to produce this tumor. Now, what about the other forms of kidney cancer? What is the status of mtDNA in these tumors? What can we learn from our uncommon but extraordinary tumor that may apply to these more common forms of kidney cancer? When we looked at the status of mtDNA, we saw this. The different types of kidney cancer are shown here on the x-axis. As I've already illustrated to you, oncocytoma samples, as indicated by the size of the red bar, have an enrichment for these complex one loss of function mutations. Interestingly, when you look at chromophobe kidney cancer, it is the eosinophilic variant, the variant with the tons of mitochondria, that you see the accumulation of these complex one mutations. When you looked at the classic variant, you do not see these mutations. Furthermore, when you look at clear cell kidney cancer, a disease of loss of VHL, 90% of the kidney tumors we see clinically, there is not this enrichment of complex one mtDNA mutations. However, stepping back and looking at the data from a different vantage point, there is a subset of clear cell kidney cancer that has these mtDNA mutations, about 10%, that we think, based on our investigation of renal oncocytoma, are real cancer driver events. We do not yet know clinically what the predictive or prognostic impact of these mutations in these tumors is at this time point. Looking at mtDNA copy number across all these different kidney tumors, we saw the following interesting result. As predicted, mtDNA copies were increased in renal oncocytoma along with the eosinophilic variant of chromophobe. However, there was this dramatic reduction in mtDNA copy number in clear cell kidney cancer. It was as if these tumors, which had lost VHL, activated HIF, were somehow selecting for loss 
of their mtDNA as if they didn't like oxidative phosphorylation consistent with these tumors uh, thought to be very highly glycolytic in nature. Thus, in conclusion for our mtDNA platform in kidney cancer, especially oncocytoma, we've concluded that the level of sequence, there are recurrent loss of function mutations specifically in complex one. These occur at high heteroplasmy, and this also occurs in the context of increased mtDNA copy number. Having now interrogated the DNA, we switched to understand what was happening at the level of gene expression and protein expression. Utilizing RNA-seq and a principal component analysis, we were able to identify that tumor cells are distinct from normal renal epithelium. And furthermore, tumor cells that had lost chromosome 1 also appear differently in principal component space compared to tumors that had retained chromosome 1. Importantly, this was not due to genes located on chromosome 1. This was independent of that. A gene set enrichment analysis identified that there was an upregulation of OXFOS and TCA cycle in our tumors compared to normals, and mTOR signaling along with insulin receptor signaling also appeared to be enriched in tumors. Unsupervised two-dimensional hierarchical clustering was able to identify that nuclear encoded OXFOS complexes were consistently upregulated in tumors as compared to normals. However, there was a dysynchrony when we looked at the status of the mtRNA in that the mtRNA species were not consistently elevated in tumors as compared to normals. Performing motif aid analysis, looking at genes that were enriched in tumors compared to normals, we were able to identify that the motif signature for the canonical transcription factor regulators of mitobiogenesis, NRF1, NRF2, ESR-alpha, YY1, all the transcription factors that partner with PGC1-alpha, the master regulator of mitochondrial biogenesis as is, as is seen to respond in muscles when we all exercise, were all upregulated in our tumors. Next, we looked at complex one by immunohistochemical staining. Consistent with the genetic signature, there was loss of complex one immunoreactivity in tumors as compared to normal renal epithelium. Importantly, distal parts of OXFOS, such as complex four, were markedly upregulated in the tumors. So it's loss of this first step of OXFOS, but retention of all the distal steps. And this is quantified here via pathologist examination. I didn't have time to go into this data, but what we also observed and of interest given our morning discussion of epigenetic changes that occur, and especially the paradigm for epigenetic changes that can occur due to metabolic enzyme mutations, we see a marked upregulation in KIT. This is one of the top 50 genes expressed in the tumors as compared to normals in the context of these mitochondrial DNA mutations. And KIT is a bona fide oncogenic driver. I've already discussed, but these tumors also in a subset show marked overexpression of cyclin D1. Having identified this rich signal at the level of gene expression for upregulation of known mitochondrial enzymatic pathways, along with a potential uh, oncogenic driver, we next sought to identify if there was an oncometabolite akin to what we see with IDH mutations that was being secreted or produced by these tumors in the context of complex one mutation, performing mass spectrometry analysis across various columns, we were able to identify that there were significant metabolites that were both up and down regulated in our tumors in the context of complex one deficiency. Looking at this S plot, engaging what the most upregulated metabolites in tumors were, we saw that it was glutathione, the number one upregulated metabolite with a 200-fold upregulation in tumors compared to normal was glutathione, and the third one was the oxidized species of glutathione, and these were highly statistically significant. When we looked at the percentage of the total glutathione pool, which was being increased in these tumors, there is a relative increase in the proportion of oxidized glutathione, as illustrated by red, compared to the normals. And this is consistent with how we think about mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation. A lot of reactive oxygen species can be generated. And specifically, complex one appears to be a hub for generation of ROS. So this might be an interesting way that the tumors have adapted to cope with this potential second messenger. It's almost like having your cake and eating it too. In conclusion, this analysis led us to propose the following genetic model for renal oncocytoma. You start with a distal tubule normal renal epithelial cell. Interestingly, these normal cells are one of the most mitochondria-rich cells in our body. They have a ton of mitochondria to begin with. 
And this is due to all the active transport that's occurring by the second in our kidneys to pump solutes across concentration gradients. Then, due to time and stochastic chance, a complex one homopolymeric indel will occur. This will then change this original cell, making it a distal tubule cell with an mtDNA mutation. However, this mtDNA mutation is not yet sensed due to the multi-copy buffering nature of the mitochondrial genome. Over time, via a process known as genetic drift in the mitochondrial DNA, this normal distal tubule cell will now become a distal tubule cell with an oxfos defect. It's in this context that these mutations now are sensed. And once they become sensed, then potentially selection can occur. And with selection, along with the gene expression changes that we know involve energy st stress sensing involving AMP kinase, PGC1-alpha activation, a massive mitobiogenesis signal ensues, along with some data which I haven't shared for a defective mitophagic response, and this culminates in a kidney cell with a ton of mitochondria. It is in that setting that we think the nucleus now comes into play, and via either cyclin D1 rearrangement or chromosome 1 loss, then the right sort of hits have occurred on this original cell to produce renal oncocytoma. I'd like to thank several people who were involved in this project. My research mentor, Dr. Vamsi Mutha, my clinical mentor, Dr. Jor Michelson, and a career mentor, Dr. Bruce Chebner, for all his help. This uh, analysis couldn't have been done without all the people shown here, our renal oncocytoma team. I'd like to particularly highlight the work of Sarah Calvo, a computational biologist in our lab who helped study the uh, mtDNA, and I'm part of the Bertucci Center for General Urinary Malignancies, and my research has been done as part of an ASCO YA award this year. Thank you all. What's the signal to make more mitochondria? I think it relates to ROS. I think sort of closer to the eventual product of increased mitochondria is PGC1-alpha. And what, up, what activates PGC1-alpha, I can't mechanistically say right now, but I think it relates to complex one being lost and generating a lot of ROS that the glutathione helps buffer, that downstream along with energy crisis activates AMP kinase to then kick in PGC1-alpha activity. Why do the oncocytomas stop growing? Excellent question. Um, <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's like a Trojan horse. I think these tumors have something that initially they like and that help them grow, but eventually it gets to a point where it's like an Achilles heel. They can't spread and they can't grow with these tons of mitochondria. Maybe that's due to too high of a burden of reactive oxygen species being present. Alternatively, these tumors are pretty nuclear genomically silent. They don't have a high mutation rate compared to other cancers that we all have sort of talked about today. So it may be that their nucleus is just not mutated enough to eventually metastasize. Okay. Okay, so the first question is, why complex one? Uh, how does that benefit a tumor? And the second is, uh, if you perturb oxfos or if you have a TCA cycle mutation, wouldn't that decrease reactive oxygen species? So why do you have an upregulation of glutathione? In answer to your first question, we don't yet know conclusively why losing complex one is beneficial, but we have a couple hypotheses. Number one, actually just piggybacking on what Dave just told us about, uh, if complex one is lost, complex two and DHODH goes faster. And DHODH makes pyrimidines, that's the de novo pyrimidine biosynthesis pathway. Cancer cells are dividing, making a lot of DNA, they need nucleotides. So losing complex one could be advantageous for making more nucleotide pools, number one. Number two, complex one is an important regulator of the apoptotic response. It has many subunits that are cleaved when apoptosis is activated, and those subunits, when cleaved, help regulate the apoptotic cascade. So losing complex one could take away an apoptogenic stimulus. Number three, complex one, when mutated or when dysfunctional or when perturbed with aging, like we see in Parkinson's disease patients, who when they get to 70 or 80 or have been exposed to certain pesticides that target complex one, turns into a time bomb that generates a lot of ROS. And in the context of this ROS, tumor cells may have an addiction that ensues due to some of the second messenger, second messenger signaling aspects of ROS. Flipping to the second part of the question, uh, why the glutathione result, even though you have a mutation in a TCA cycle enzyme, or in this case, a mitochondrial oxfos enzyme, and you think, okay, there's less energy metabolism going on, actually the right way to think about it, I think, is there's dysfunctional mitochondrial metabolism going on, and the dysfunction, the lack of quality control due to the change in the DNA of the mitochondria, 
is what creates the Ross storm and the tumors need the glutathione to survive that. Rick. Roger, so um, the loss of chromosome one and the, and the rearrangement of cyclin D1, is this something that you would see also in your eosinophilic forms of chromophobe? Or yes. The, or the 10% of the, of the uh, clear cell RCCs that you described were very similar? Great question. So clear cell RCC 90% of the time loses chromosome three. It does not typically lose chromosome one. And we don't know about the 10%, whether there's a subset that are losing chromosome one there. But eosinophilic chromophobe, we do. Eosinophilic chromosome recapitulates that finding. It loses chromosome one. There's something on chromosome one that, when lost, is helping these tumors grow with a dysfunctional mitochondria.